What's going on, everybody? Logan Arliss here, Illinois Aviation Academy, coming to you live for another Webinar Wednesday event. Beautiful Wednesday here in Chicago. Got a lot of flying in today. Matter of fact, still some students up getting some work in. So I'd like to start off with some announcements from the Academy. Uh, Mr. Will Ditch, Mr. Wenhao Yu, and Mr. Mario Nanaman. So Will Ditch completed his first solo flight. Wenhao Yu achieved his uh, instrument rating, and Mario Nanaman also achieved his commercial certificate. So congratulations to these three individuals. Keep up the good work, guys. And uh, we'll get into our webinar guest tonight, which will be Mr. Rod Machado. Now, Rod Machado is truly a, a pioneer of the flight training industry. Um, he has instructed hundreds to fly as a CFI, thousands in a classroom environment as an instructor, over 350,000 students through his 400 aviation articles, and uh, over 100,000 through his training materials, and also several million with his flight lessons uh, on Microsoft Flight Simulator. Now he's truly lived a, a life of aviation. He has degrees in psychology and aviation science. He's an airline transport pilot rated with uh, all fixed rank wing flight powered instructor ratings. He started instructing students full time in 1973, taught ground schools often uh, to classrooms of 200 students starting in 1975. He's taught many hundreds of aviation safety seminars in the United States, Canada, as well as Europe. He's also taught uh, many flight instructor revalidation clinics, also in the United States, Canada, and Europe. 10,000 hours of flight time, which were earned, uh, like we like to say, the hard way, one flight instruction hour at a time. He co-wrote and co-anchored ABC's Wide World of Flying for five years. He was AOPA's National Flight Instructor Spokesman for 15 years. He was asked by Microsoft to design the lessons and to be the CFI voice for the Microsoft Flight Simulator program. Was a columnist for AOPA Pilot Magazine for 18 years, a columnist for Flight Training Magazine for 25 years, and he personally writes and illustrates all of his own training materials. And if you've ever seen any of his uh, videos or his training materials, they're second to none. I mean, he, he uses humor to help you remember things and he really makes learning aviation fun. Um, so he's truly an expert in the flight training industry and we are so very fortunate uh, to have him on our show tonight and to listen to him speak. So without further ado, how are you doing, Mr. Machado? Logan, I'm doing very well, how are you? I'm doing great. How's, uh, how's the weather out on the uh, West Coast? Um, the weather on the West Coast is, uh, well, almost always the same, as a matter of fact. It's excellent. It's kind of like, well, not being in England, because in England, whenever the sun comes out, somebody reports it as a UFO, because they don't see the sun very often in England. But weather's pretty nice out here. We're getting the typical uh, June gloom, low stratus out here, but uh, it's, it's great. Weather's just fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, I was just telling everyone it's we're very, very fortunate to have you as a guest, and we want to thank you sincerely for giving us the thank time you. to speak tonight. And with that, I'll, I'll hand the reins over to you, and uh, we'll get the show going. That sounds great, Logan. I'm not seeing anybody in the uh, video queue. Do you want to give that to me, or do you uh, want to That's keep funny. that for yourself there? Yeah, so nobody's uh, going to be actually on the Zoom conference call with us, so we are just streaming live to Facebook, so they're all going to okay. be viewing it through the Facebook feed. Okay, okay, that's that's fine, that's fine. Um, uh, again, Logan, thanks so much for uh, for asking me to speak at the Illinois Aviation Academy, and I feel honored that uh, uh, you would do that, and I feel honored to be here. Um, and of course, you asked me to speak on a topic that is one of my favorite, and that happens to be, well, all aviation topics are pretty much my favorite, but one that I dearly enjoy talking about is uh, flight training and flight training proficiency, as well as, um, you know, how to make the most out of our flight training, and as well as how to fly safely. Those are very, very important things. And uh, I've been doing this now for, well, been flying for, uh, let's see, since 1970. So uh, that, uh, and flight instructing for since 1973. So it's probably one of the most uh, fun, enjoyable things I've ever done. And it's a very unique and honorable profession, in my opinion. And uh, I probably learned more about 
psychology, uh, teaching people how to fly than I ever did sitting in any graduate psychology class. It's truly a uh, unique experience to, to see that. Part of the unique experience, by the way, is being able to train someone tell them something, uh, express it in a way that has a permanent, a relatively permanent change on their behavior, and then watch them do that. It, it's, it just blows me away because you know how well you communicate and you immediately know how well you don't communicate, such as if you say back pressure, back pressure, I need more back pressure. And you see the student pushing his heels into the carpet, forcing his back against the seat of the airplane, you know that you're not conveying your objectives uh, properly, certainly not conveying them in terms of behavioral terms. <laughs> so, and there are a lot of things like that. Get your nose up, get your nose down, get your nose up. Or my favorite, you're downwind and the controller calls the student and says, extend your downwind leg. And for a brief second, the student actually thinks about putting his leg outside the airplane. So uh, there are a lot of strange things that happen when you teach people how to fly, but that's what makes a person a good communicator. You get immediate feedback. And that immediate feedback is, uh, is very important for a flight instructor because let's face it, uh, if you're a math teacher, if you're an English teacher and so on, you may not get that feedback until let's say six months go, goes by and then the student takes a test. And then uh, you'll know whether or not in the long run, the, the behavior you want was the behavior you got in terms of the student, not in an airplane. When it comes to over, let's say, uh, uh, 12 to 15, 16 hour period where you're preparing someone for solo, uh, you know whether the student's learning and or, and or not learning. And uh, by the time when the time comes for them to solo, where they actually take that airplane taxi out to the runway, you're willing to test what you know and your teaching ability and put it right out there on the line and watch this person solo. That's an admirable quality. And it also reinforces uh, your um your, your, your skills in the sense that you know what works and you know what doesn't work. Being a flight instructor, like I say, is an amazing experience. Although I have to admit, one time I had a student in a Cessna 150 that was November 0, uh, 0, 0, 0, 7. And I'm soloing this person as he's taxiing out. I just happened to glance at the numbers, the last three numbers on the tail, and I saw him in a different way. I'm thinking 007, double, James Bond. Oh no, license to kill. I got to go get this guy. So no, he, he did fight. He did fight, of course. But you know, they, like, like I say, it's a, it's a fascinating experience and a unique uh, opportunity. And I would encourage anybody who wants to become a flight instructor, as long as you enjoy teaching and you enjoy people and flying, of course, uh, I would encourage you to do so. You know, um, one of the things that, that, that's interesting uh, in terms of, uh, and I, I hope your flight school would find this interesting, and I'm sure that it's a problem that challenges the Illinois Aviation Academy, and that is, how do we get more people involved in aviation? And that's a question that's asked quite commonly uh, by the uh, FAA uh, flight schools and uh, for that matter, anybody else that runs an aviation business. And I always thought the question was kind of interesting because I'm not sure that's the right question to ask. The question that I find far more interesting is how do we keep the people that we already have in aviation. You see, uh, AOPA did a study that confirmed what most people who've been in the business for quite a long time know. And that is when a person starts training, a flight training as a, a primary student, how many of those people actually complete their training? Well, it turns out about 20% do and 80% leave. Now, at first, uh, many, many years ago, I, I never thought about that that very much, but then I started watching and seeing what happens to people that come to the flight line, take, fly, take flying lessons, and then eventually just disappear. And I think that's a very, very accurate statistic for uh, what goes on with people that engage in flight training. So I started thinking, well, why is that? Why is it that one out of five complete, four out of five um, leave the, the aviation uh, training activity and go on to do something else? And as best I can tell, based on my experience and just uh, em empirical observation, uh, money, of course, is always thought to be a very big issue there. And uh, yeah, I think that that is indeed true, although I'd like to think that anybody that begins, begins flight training uh, is going to have a pretty good idea of exactly how much it's going to cost. I mean, it's right there on the brochure, right? Oh, wait a minute. Brochures don't lie. Uh, it's on the brochure, but we know that those probably are the um, uh, cost for, let's say, 
uh, obtaining a private license based on the minimum number of hours that the FAA allows. In reality, we know that according to FAA statistics, the average time required for a private pilot earning a private pilot certificate is about 70.1 hours. And it takes typically six months uh, to a year. Not, well, let's say on the average, probably a better nine months to a year to complete that training. Some people, of course, manage to extend that for great lengths of time. So, yeah, money. I, I got that. I mean, after all, if a, Cessna, a, a Cirrus or a Cessna 172, if that's what your flight school is, is running, is charging um, $160, $170 per hour, and the flight instructor charges $60, $70 per hour, it's easy to rack up on one flight a $400 bill uh, for one complete lesson. And uh, folks, that's a lot of money. And that's a lot of money to a lot of people. So uh, after a while that, you know, you, one, one starts to wonder how, you know, how, how can I increase my efficiency in training and how can I uh, uh, do it in a, a way that's much more affordable? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but the uh, issue that I see has in terms of why people leave flight training uh, and don't complete it doesn't have as much to do with money based on, uh, or and not as much, but certainly money's important. Uh, it tends to be more a factor of the experience they have during the first 10 to 15 hours of flight training. And by that, I mean, I think we drive more people away from aviation than we uh, bring in simply because we don't make the experience a very pleasant experience for them. We don't make it as pleasant as we could make it. And uh, then you have to ask, why is that? What is it that might cause, cause the experience to be less enjoyable? And think about this now. We only have two basic fears, a fear of falling and a fear of loud noises. Now, personally, I have a fear of making loud noises while falling, but that's my thing. If a person is going to jump in an airplane with a flight instructor, what that person has to do is put his or her trust in that instructor. If the instructor is not cognizant of the student's uh, uh, emotional state, uh, the student's emotional disposition, and uh, does something to scare that student, that student's probably not going to come back. Because remember, when a student gets in an airplane, they're having to confront their natural fear, which is, of course, the fear of falling, which, by the way, is one reason why in an airplane, when I take off, the last thing I do is make my first turn a left steep turn on takeoff because I don't want the student looking down at the northern hemisphere and uh, not seeing anything but the northern hemisphere out that window because that's what the student sees. So of course, I'll try to make a right turn uh, if I can or a very shallow bank turn. If I make a right turn, that's a good thing because the student sees me there and uh, no way I'm gonna let him fall out that window. Uh, because he's my student and we just don't do things like that. So we have to be aware of what the student's thinking and their emotional response. And uh, as a result, all you have to do, think about this, think about the responsibility a CFI has. All you have to do is scare one student and that's on the first, second, third flight or any flight up until let's say they solo. And that student will probably never ever return to aviation and for the rest of their life, that aviation will be something that they want to stay away from. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again. And that's a, a terrible thing to do. So, uh, but I don't think many instructors do that intentionally, but the fact is that they may do that um, accidentally or uh, be unaware of the fact that what they're doing might actually frighten the student. Most important, I think we have to make the learning process a fun process. And what that also means is that students have to have some satisfaction when they get out of an airplane. One of the things I, I try to do with my students is I never let an airplane, a student get out of an airplane unless they know they've experienced some form of success. Now, you don't have to really look hard to find something that the student has done successful. I mean, sometimes you can say, well, Bob, you're, you, you, you're missing the runway closer now. Uh, and that's a form of success, but uh, you can find something as a reward to provide the student. But I'm speaking in very global terms here, thinking in terms of making the student, making the experience a general, a generally beneficial one, an enjoyable one, and one they know that the money they're spending is reaping a reward. And that's extremely important. So the next thing is, how can you make this whole process affordable? And um, one of the things that uh, I've done with many of my students, and that is being done across the country, is uh, uh, using flight simulators as a means of reducing the cost of flight training. Now, I have a friend at um, 
Cypress College. His name is Captain Ed Valdez, and Ed is an amazing instructor. He's a, a captain for United Airlines, but he has such a passion for general aviation. And uh, he teaches the uh, aviation course at Cypress. He's head of that department. And if you ever walked into Ed's flight laboratory, what you'll see uh, are uh, a, a series of uh, screens and simulators, control columns, rudder pedals, the standard simulator setup, you might see a fancy one for Microsoft Flight Simulator, but it's, it's, a, it's a very sexy one because you have at least two 24 inch panels uh, side to side and there are certain bays, simulator bays that have a little bit more, a few more uh, panels. So uh, what Ed does is this, Ed, starts them off in the class. Uh, most of these folks have never taken any training whatsoever and does this. What he does, in fact, I would say for everybody out there listening to this right now, um, I'd like to do a behavioral science intervention uh, activity with you. And this includes you too, Logan. I'd like you to take your finger and I'd like you to put it in your ear. No, go ahead, do that right now. If everybody would do that, you'll love this. I mean, this is a very effective behavioral uh, modification technique. Okay, it's in the air. Great, because what I'm about to say is so important, I do not want it going in one ear and out the other. So I just keep it in there. Logan, you can take yours out. The, the issue here is Ed realizes perhaps the single most important thing um, any teacher should realize when it comes to teaching somebody how to fly. And I'll tell you what it is in a quote from a book called The Dancing Wu Li Masters. That was a book on quantum physics, but it was written by Gary Zukov. And in the introduction to the book, Gary Zukov says this about teachers, masters. Gary Zukov says that the master does not speak of gravity until the student stands in awe of the falling leaf. Now think about that for a second. That's not a throwaway line. The master does not speak of gravity until the student stands in awe of the falling leaf. What does that mean? It means that when a student approaches learning, the student has to have an appreciation for the basics that he or she is going to learn. And if they, if they know how important the basics are, every single step, all the little components that are assembled via the building block method of learning into the larger component, which is the ultimate uh, end game skill that we want to have. If the student understands the value of each and every one of those components, then the student is standing in awe of the falling leaf. Because now the student is not going to want, is, is going to be willing to spend the time to practice those basics to, um, uh, in, in other words, uh, to uh, repeat them over and over again, knowing that practice does not make proficient, practice makes permanent. In other words, uh, practice eventually uh, evolves into an habitual reflex, which of course we call a behavior and becomes permanent as part of the student. And Ed starts them out on, out on the basics. Now, what kind of basics are we talking about? Hmm, let's see. Oh, attitude plus power equals performance, as an example. Now, that is very basic. A certain attitude versus a certain amount of power equals a certain amount of performance. And I said that uh, quite precisely. I didn't say attitude plus a certain amount of throttle position equals a certain amount of performance. I said attitude plus power equals performance. And you know at 10,000 feet, I say 10,000 feet because that's an altitude my Cessna 150 has never been to. Uh, that's its goal, you might say. Um, 10,000 feet full throttle is not going to give you anywhere near as much power uh, as sea level with full throttle. In fact, my Cessna 150 uh, really only has two throttle positions in it. Yes, I own a Cessna 150. I had a P210, but I sold that a couple of years ago, and now I have a Cessna 150 I use for training. It only has two throttle positions, fly, no fly. That, that's it. No, Logan, you're laughing at the wrong stuff. Fly, no fly, fly, no fly. And sometimes at a high altitude, it's no fly, no fly. Doesn't make any difference. But the fact is that if you start out with the basics, and if you're a student, you're willing to stand in awe of the falling leaf, if I may use that example there, then you'll find yourself progressing so much more quickly, or you'll find yourself progressing uh, with uh, uh, much more authority in terms of 
uh, your control of the basics, your understanding of the basics, and your ability to perform uh, uh, in uh, the and learn in the necessary steps needed to eventually require the private pilot skill that you want to take your private pilot check right. The basics are so essentially important for students and for instructors, and that's what Ed does. And let me tell you a story that, uh, hold on for a second, I'm going to have some iced tea here. I just want to make sure you understand, this is iced tea, all right? So um, if it wasn't, no telling what kind of seminar you would get. But uh, no, it's just iced tea. I shouldn't joke around like that. I know this is why I should never be left alone without adult supervision. But I've got Logan here looking after me, so I feel quite secure. Um, the, um, the, the, the thing that Ed does and the way he works can produce this kind of behavior. Ed had a student that sat in his course, course for six months. The student had no flight time whatsoever. During the middle of the six-month course, the student went out and took a um, demo flight. That's the first time he's ever been in an airplane. And the student didn't go in an airplane again until three months later at the end of the six-month course, the simulator course at Cypress College. And the student then went to the airport, and I'm telling you, I am not making this up. Uh, this is, uh, I, I save all the making up stuff toward the very end of this webinar. Logan, I don't know if you got that, but that's, uh, you might want to write that down. And uh, no, Logan's a great straight man, of course. He didn't know he was going to be one, but he is one now. And uh, six months later, student goes to the airport again, second time. Again, student only has 45 minutes of uh, a demo flight time and says to the instructor, what I'd like to do is this, assuming you're willing, I would like to go ahead and fly the airplane myself. I would like to work all the radios. I would like to do everything. And uh, please take over if you have to, but let me go as far as I can. And the result was that the student was able to do everything and the instructor only had to take over one time. And uh, I, I'm not sure exactly when that was. I, I don't recall. Uh, I, landing or takeoff, I don't know. But uh, in, in this instance, the student essentially was able to do every single thing uh, necessary to fly an airplane. And that is the power of a flight simulator, assuming you use it properly. Now, I know some flight instructors say, well, you know, if you use a flight simulator, you develop bad habits. Well, you know, I know of a lot of students that fly with instructors that develop bad habits too. And they're the habits that are given to them by the flight instructor. So uh, the thing is, of course, you, ha you have to have a good flight instructor here, that's assumed. And that instructor can guide you in the use of that, uh, that flight simulator, or you can buy a book uh, on how to fly an airplane, and that would be a great tool to use with your flight simulator, your Microsoft flight simulator, and uh, it would allow you to practice your skills at home. Let me give you an example of another skill that you can use uh, that uh, is a skill that I use, I have my students use when they are um, using the simulator on their own. And this skill is uh, a skill, there are many little skills that you can, you can practice and just in isolation. And this is called Suburi training, S-U-B-U-R-I. And if you go to my website at rodmachado.com, look under the blog, scroll down on the blog and you'll see a, an article or, uh, titled Suburi training, S-U-B-U-R-I. Suburi training is a Japanese word for micro practice. And it's, it means repetitive practice over and over of a small behavior. It, it, it just, it's fascinating how this works. I can dramatically improve your performance in, in preparation to land an airplane by having you do one thing. Sit in your simulator, set it up so you're a half mile from the end of the runway, you're 500 feet above ground, and at your typical 1.3 times VSO approach speed, but don't, don't use any flaps in this case, have it so 1.3 times um, VS, and let's say in a Cessna 150, that's 65 knots, 1.3 times VSO, which also happens to be close to its maximum cruise speed, so the, uh, I'm just kidding, some of these are just for me, by the way, so in the 150, there I am on final approach, 65 knots, and, and I have kicked in the turbulence factor to, let's say, moderate turbulence and no crosswind when blowing right down the runway. And then I have my students repeat, uh, and then I click off pause and have the student fly the airplane all the way down to flare. Their objective is one objective and this only one objective. It's not to flare the airplane. That's not the objective. The objective is to keep the airplane longitudinal axis perfectly aligned with the runway and keep the wings level. 
So you use your rudders to keep the airplane perfectly aligned with the runway and you use your ailerons to keep the wings level. Wind is blowing right down the runway. So you don't need to do anything else here in terms of correcting for a crosswind. And you practice that over and over and over. And as the wing tip is tipped up by turbulence, you make a correction, use rudder to compensate for adverse yaw. You practice that for an hour. And let's say you practice it three or four times uh, before your next flight. Maybe you practice it for an hour, maybe you practice it for a half hour, but let's say you have at least two hours of that repetitive Suburi training practice in, and then you go out and fly and you'll see a dramatic change in your ability to be able to keep the airplane aligned with the runway. And of course, you're also keeping the airplane at the proper pitch attitude to maintain that airspeed. So there are really two components, three components, longitudinal axis, wing level, and pitch in order to keep the airplane at the proper speed. Pitch is not much of an issue because we're dealing with just a little bit of turbulence here. So it's not going to have a dramatic effect on pitch, but it is going to train you to use rudder and aileron in coordination. So there are a lot of little things like that. And if you take those things and practice them in your flight simulator, uh, there's not a way in the world you cannot reduce the cost of flight training, but do it under the supervision of a good flight instructor. Oh, by the way, um, talk about good flight instructors. Not all flight instructors are made equal. When people ask me what's the most important thing that anybody can do in order to be able to improve their, or to, to um, ensure their ability to acquire a flight instructor certificate, I say one thing. I say it's the only thing that matters, nothing matters more. You can take your finger out of your ear now, but uh, th there's nothing that matters more and that is finding a good flight instructor. Nothing matters more. It's the single most important determinant in uh, uh, evaluating whether you even have a good chance of getting a private pilot uh, certificate or being one of the four of the uh, five that typically walk away from flight training. In fact, there's an old Chinese saying, I would say it in the original Mandarin. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to speak Mandarin. So it never has the same effect when I do that. So uh, I'll say it like this. It is better to look for a good instructor for three years than to spend even three minutes with a bad one. I cannot tell you how important that is. It, it is so important, it makes all the difference in the world. How do you find a good flight instructor? Well, I have an article on that on my blog at rodmachado.com. You can read all about it, but I will say this. Um, you have to do a little gumshoe work and get out, pound the pavement and ask a lot of questions. And if you do that, you'll eventually find somebody whose reputation, and that's what you're looking for here, who has a good reputation. In other words, has the ability to produce, but also is a person that other people like to be with. If you don't have that folks, I mean, what? Why even go out and train? I mean, that takes the fun out of the whole experience. And believe me, I, I, you can you can have a bad experience with some instructors. I, I had I had one guy, one guy for he he, I had one guy in my multi engine uh, when I first started multi engine training. He had, uh, and I can tell you some strange stories here. But he, as we're taxiing out, I sensed that he was a little on edge, and uh, he kept looking around as you should do, but. He always kept looking at me as if I was going to do something wrong in the multi-engine airplane, which of course was very wise on his part because I did do a few things wrong initially. But anyway, he took this ch chart and he, he rolled it up and he went, tur, 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 tur. and I, I said, excuse me, sir, what, what are you going to do with that? He says, all you have to do is make one mistake and whack, I'm going to, going to whack you with it. And uh, I thought, wow, this is like being in Catholic school again. Uh, and uh, and I, I went to Catholic school and I remember Sister Sugar Ray Jiu-Jitsu, who I recently saw at the Interfaith Kung Fu Trials. And uh, boy, that was a good flashback, having Catholic flashbacks. That's amazing. But anyway, the instructor didn't hit me. He didn't whack me with it, even though he was uh, properly qualified because he was using a whack chart at the time. So I think that's why the FA named it that. And then, you know, I've had instructors yell at me, not too many though, I had, I really did have good instructors, but I can tell you horror stories about flight instructors that have abused their privilege. And if you'd like to read a few of them, go to my blog and read the article titled Bad Instructors and How to Avoid Them. And uh, it's, it's a real eye opener. So, you know, you, you have to have a good CFI. Second thing is you have to participate in your own education. There's just not a way in the world that somebody knows how to teach you unless you fess up on how you learn best. 
So when you go to a flight instructor, you know, tell them, hey, listen, this is how I learn. I like to see a lot of demonstrations before I actually practice. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I like to practice before I uh, maybe show one demonstration and then let, let, me get my, let me get my feet wet. Let me go ahead and actually try it. And then you can demonstrate some more. Um, you, could, you could say, I like, like it when you talk. I, I, I don't like to hear too much talking. I like to, I'm more active and I'd like to, you know, be physically involved uh, and, and so on and so forth. You have to take that a rather assertive stance at being able to guide your own education. And in other words, uh, people, and remember, I, it's a phrase that I use quite a bit uh, in, uh, in dealing with people. And that is, um, we teach other people how to behave towards us. Ultimately, it all comes down to that particular statement. I can teach you if somebody's angry, if somebody's frustrated, or if somebody's um, not doing the right thing when I'm involved with them, I, somehow or another, I'm not teaching them properly. So I need to have somebody, if I'm dealing with someone, teach them how to um, uh, behave in the proper way. I teach other people how to behave the way I want them to toward me. So it's a very proactive, not passive. It's very proactive. And that's the way you should be in that instance. Um, the uh, other things that are, to me, are, are fascinating is when you're dealing with somebody and taking flight training lessons, this is always a rather controversial subject, but I, I just, I love talking about it. When you start out and you wanna to learn to be a private pilot, then be a private pilot. In other words, tell your instructor, listen, I'd like you to train me to the standards that are in the uh, airman certification standards. Now, a lot, of, a lot of instructors say, wait, no, I don't train you to the standards. I train you to above and beyond the standards. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. As long as you tell the student that you're going to train them way beyond what is necessary, what the FA feels is necessary, what the FAA and 100 years worth of uh, repetitive tested empirical evidence indicates is the necessary skill you need to be a private pilot, you're willing to, do, to actually Push that aside and say, I'm going to train you beyond that. Let the student know and let them know it's going to cost a lot more money and let them know they may be qualified for the commercial pilot certificate by the time you get, to get done training them. The fact is that the airman certification standards are standards. And if we train our students to those standards and we train them properly, those students will be perfectly safe. If you want to train your students to standards beyond the private pilot standards, just let the student know what they're in for. Because 100 years of training students, 100 years of aviation experience, if you look back to the regulations in the early 1920s, all the way up to 2020, you'll find out that the amount of time required for a private pilot certificate really hasn't changed all that much. In fact, back in the late 1930s, it was 35 hours. Actually, 30, it was 32 hours in the 19, uh, late 1930s. And today, the minimum number of hours required for a private pilot certificate is 35 hours under Part 141. Now, that doesn't mean people acquire their license at that, in, in, at that specific time. I'm just saying those are the standards that were set. So you can train somebody to be perfectly competent, perfectly safe in uh, it, using the airman certification standards as your guide, and they can acquire a license in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable input, a reasonable cost, and as a result, become competent pilots. In no way am I saying that you should, uh, you, sh you, sh you should train them to minimum standards. I'm saying train them to the standards. In fact, how many times does the word minimum standard appear in the practical test standard? You ever thought about that? Not once. There's no statement anywhere in the Airman Certification Standards, the ACS, that says these are only minimum standards. And as a result, you should train the student beyond these standards. Because if that were the case, why have standards in the first place? If the student meets the standard, the student then is qualified to, to uh, obviously uh, fly an airplane safely. Oh, 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 at least in terms of the standards. Because that means they can fly coordinated, they can recover from stalls, they have uh, the 
uh, training that allows them to recover from stalls in, let's say, different emotional states, a relaxed state, a state of exigency, which is something they'll probably experience if indeed they were uh, accidentally making a turn to final and found their airplane starting to shudder and perhaps starting to rotate and yaw as if in preparation for a spin. They'll know how to recover from that because they've had training according to the standards. But what they might not have, and this is what's very important from the flight instructor perspective, and that is value standards. Because clearly the student should be able to fly if they are trained to the airman certification standards. Whether they have the proper values to allow them to fly safely, that's an entirely different ballgame. And let me just put it this way. When I talk about, we have attitudes and values. Attitudes are short-term behavioral dispositions. Values are long-term behavioral dispositions. Values are essentially what's important to you. That's how values would be defined. Attitudes are the way you feel at any given moment. And sometimes attitudes uh, work for you. Sometimes they work against you. I remember when I was, <laughs> I remember when I was in junior high school, um, I, I was at a, uh, I was at a dance in junior high school. I don't dance anymore, uh, folks at, at my age, because whenever I do dance, people come up and they look for my medic alert bracelet. So uh, after a while, I said, enough, enough. Uh, or they'd say something like, what are you doing? So, okay, so I, I don't dance anymore, but I watch other people dance. And at se in seventh grade, I, there was the, a Righteous Brothers song playing called You've Lost That Loving Feeling. And it was such a great, great song. And it, it inspired me. In other words, I had a change in attitude. Remember, attitudes are short-term behavioral dispositions. And all of a sudden, I thought, you know, I think I'm going to go ask Barbara Alerio to dance. Now, Barbara Alerio was a beautiful young lady. And uh, I thought, I'm going to go ask because, again, my attitude wasn't the one I should have had at that time. Why? Because Barbara Alerio's boyfriend was standing right next to her. But somehow it didn't seem important at the time. So I just went up and said, hi, Barbara, would you like to dance? And remember that song I said was playing, the one that sort of kind of put me in the, changed my attitude or kind of helped emotionally sw uh, sway me, the you lost that loving feeling. Well, uh, it, it should have had a new title and the title should have been, I've got that broken nose feeling. And uh, her boyfriend wasn't too happy with me. So uh, you can imagine what happened after that. And that actually was a, um, a focal point memory for me because as I, um, as I grew up, I realized, boy, my attitude can change in such a way that I might do something absolutely um, out of character. I might do absolutely something dumb. And as a result of that, it made me think, oh my gosh, you know, if, if I'm going to fly an airplane safely, I have to make sure that, you know, I know I have the proper values to fly an airplane safely, but I have to make sure that I control my attitude. And uh, what I do is a lot of self-reflective thinking, as you should do, asking myself, you know, how, how am I feeling? What, what do I need to do? And the most important thing I ask myself is what kind of pilot do I want to be now? Because when somebody says, when somebody crashes an airplane, and the NTSB shows up and the NTSB does all their assessment and everything and they make a report and what have you. And people read the report, people that know the guy that crashed or the gal that crashed, they will say in many cases, that guy was a good pilot. He was a good pilot and he crashed an airplane. Yeah, but he may have been a good pilot, but he wasn't a good pilot on that day. It's pretty hard to refute, isn't it? It's hard to refute mainly because maybe he didn't have the right attitude on that day. Maybe he was a little careless. Maybe he was uh, doing something out of character. Maybe he wasn't paying attention enough. Maybe, 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 maybe. Attitudes plus values. So in that, uh, in that instance, um, getting back to the point of being safe in an airplane and uh, getting uh, guiding your training and what have you ultimately boils down to this. You can be as safe as you want to be in an airplane, but one has to uh, make sure that you deal with the uh, thoughts that go on inside you, because if you get a private certificate, according to the airman certification standards, you can certainly fly an airplane, I would assume. Uh, and as a result, that would be fine, but you have to have the right attitude 
in order to be able to fly safely. And uh, hopefully you got that from your flight instructor, which is really the point in a long way around here. That's the point I was making. You got that from your flight instructor. Hopefully he or she taught you the proper values. And um, I would say this, that there are only two ways to get smart. One of them is to uh, read a lot of books. And the second way is to ask a lot of questions. So if your flight instructor is smart, they're uh, demonstrating the behaviors they want you to mimic. And as a result, via role modeling, you mimic those behaviors, okay? And th that means uh, that in, in essentially the, the best way to strengthen our values is for a flight instructor our values in an airplane and develop those values and allow us to control our attitudes is to see the flight instructor do what uh, he wants us to do. In other words, we mimic his or her behavior. There's a, a great poem that uh, goes like this. No, no written word nor moral plea can teach young hearts what they should be, nor all the books upon the shelf, but what the teachers are themselves. So uh, we know from psychology that uh, the, the most effective way for somebody to have a change in values is to be, have a role model that changes their values, hopefully in a positive way. Read a lot of books, ask a lot of questions. That's your responsibility as a student. And uh, as a result, if you aren't reading aviation books and picking up one after the other and looking for those nuggets, those great insights, you're, you're depriving yourself of a, of a great education. Most importantly, you have to ask a lot of questions. And by that, I mean, uh, you find a flight instructor at the airport, uh, somebody with a lot of experience um, that uh, you would like to role model after, the person who has behaviors that uh, you would like to mimic, and you tug on this person's coach coattails. You follow them. You, you don't stalk them, of course. I, I know it. Listen, I've, I've had a stalker. It's, it's a bizarre thing. This blonde lady was following me all over the place. I mean, I, I, she went to Oshkosh and she went to Sun and Fun. She, I, I, at AOPA uh, seminars, I, I turn around and she was there. And it, it was as if everywhere I turned, she was there. And I guess I knew this uh, was going to happen when I married her. But, uh, well, that's what happens. So, uh, remember, some of these are just for me. Like that one. Anyway, that's my wife, Princess Buttercup. Uh, she's, uh, she, she's a pilot, too, by the way. And a commercial instrument rated pilot and an extra traffic controller, too. You should hear the way we talk around here. Hun, are you ready to go? Stand by. You're number one for the callback. Oh, well, can you give me an ETA? Proceed to the penalty box. Hold. Expect further clearance in 10. Oh, man. It goes on like this all day, over and over. But we're very effective communicators, and nobody else can understand what we're talking about that's not a pilot. So there you go. And that's how that works. All right. Uh, so I listen, I can go on and on about that. But read a lot of books. Ask a lot of questions. I, I don't know if I can give you any better advice in terms of... Uh, uh, becoming smarter as a pilot. And again, I just want to make my point, make sure my point's clear. If you're trained to the standards in the Airman Certification Standard, you'll get your license and certificate at a, at, a, a, at a reasonable time. In other words, not an excessive time, not at a minimum time, and not in a, at, at a uh, below minimum time necessarily, unless you, of course you use simulators and then you might not uh, need as, uh, you know, you certainly won't need more than the minimum actual flight time. But uh, with that in mind, um, you have to work on your values training. In other words, you, you need to be able to control what's going on inside you, uh, your impulses, your desires, your, your uh, willingness to try to get home when the weather's poor. And you need to have skills that help you avoid temptation. And I, I, that sounds like a theology lecture, doesn't it? Uh, but in reality, you need some of those value skills and you get them by reading a lot of books and asking a lot of questions. Okay, what books? All right, try this. Um, there's an amazing book that is one of the most beautifully books, uh, ever, to, in my opinion, ever written. It's probably more beautiful on the original French. It was written by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry and the title is Wind, Sand and Stars. It is insanely beautiful. And it's about a, um, an airmail pilot in the, uh, in the 1940s, uh, pre-1940s. And it's about flying in the Andes and uh, South America, which of course, Andes and, and uh, all over uh, Europe. And it's, it's insane. And there are nut nuggets and bits in there that when you read them, uh, in fact, I did an entire lecture on this one time called Pilots, Poets, and Psychologists. 
And uh, the uh, insight that you get by reading this book is truly amazing. But let's see, Wind, Sand and Stars, a Richer Box um, book. Oh, the, the name escapes, it come back and uh, it'll come back in a second. Ernie Gann's book, Fate is the Hunter. And there are so many other wonderful books. So, you know, get them, uh, ask around, check on them and uh, see who's reading what and do that. And then ask a lot of questions, attend safety seminars and so on and so forth. So that's how that goes. Now, again, I can go on and on, but Logan, do we have uh, people that have any questions? And I'd be more than happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, we got a few questions. So one um, pretty good question. So with the advancement of, of aircraft and technology, you know, G-1000s are now making their way into training aircraft and um, into smaller training aircraft. Is it essential to train in uh, with these newer avionics to be uh, beneficial further on in your career? So would it make sense for somebody to, you know, start their training in a G-1000 knowing that, you know, in the future, they're, they're probably going to be pl flying an aircraft with similar uh, technology? That is a great question. Excellent question. Next question. <laughs> no, 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 I'll take that question. It's a great question. Okay, let, let's, let, let's, let's establish a baseline here. If it were necessary for people to have experience using uh, a, a, a flight management system and an electronic flight display so that they can use a flight management system and an electronic flight display, display then nobody who ever flew an ancient DC-8 that upgraded to a 767 with all the fancy electronic equipment inside would ever be able to do so, all right? So there's proof. You don't need experience to upgrade to the uh, more fancy electronic flight display. If you believe you do, that's kind of like believing that pre-ignition is the ability to see sparks from the future. It's not true, not true. What is true is this. When you're learning to fly, you should be concentrating on one thing. What do you concentrate on? It's sort of embedded in the first sentence I used, learning to fly. It makes absolutely no difference. It, it, excuse me. It makes a very big difference when you start your training if you have to start your training, let's say in a Piper Cub, one of the most amazing airplanes to ever learn in. Uh, and if you can't do that, then maybe a uh, Cessna 150, some light airplane, if you can possibly fit in one, not everybody can. Flying in a Piper Cub versus flying in a G1000 equipped Cessna 172. I realize this may shock a lot of people, but um, the skills, behaviors, and the insights and the values that you need are better trained in the Piper Cup than in the G1000 172 equipped airplane. Oh, oh, you can, you can train the same skills and in, in the 172 as you can in the Piper Cub. I hope this doesn't scare you like that. Kind of like Pac-Man, the old video game. It scares me. So uh, the 172 is great, but folks, I would much rather train somebody in the simplest airplane possible for one reason, and that is you're learning to fly. Learn to fly in uh, an aircraft that requires you to fly the aircraft and concentrate on flying. Minimum instrument panel would be great. It's, it's got to have some instruments in it, of course, and uh, the six pack, uh, wh whatever will be necessary to possibly to allow you to take the private pilot check ride, which pretty much means a six pack in this case. And now, of course, you need ADSB, assuming the airplane has an electrical system and, and uh, transponder and one VOR Omnihead. And okay, got that. But again, that's, that's my uh, impression there. Because when you're flying a Cessna 172 with the G1000 equipped airplane, uh, Garmin movie map display, flight management system, PDF, uh, an STEC 65 autopilot with roll steering capability, two radar altimeters, and a special seat in back that allows you to hold your two flight cases, one with charge for the Northern Hemisphere and one with charge for the Southern Hemisphere, even though you have an electronic flight bag, uh, you know, you go prepared. Folks, my, my impression is you're learning, you're learning, having to learn avionics the same time you're learning how to fly. It's much better just to do it simple first in transition. That's the answer to that question. And uh, 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 trust me, I've, I've seen both and this is just a far more effective way. And then once you uh, 
get into get the private license in a simple aircraft, what you do is you buy a um, let's say a G1000 uh, simulation software. Max Trescott has one. Um, I think Garmin has a, a, a G1000 simulator. Uh, the Kings have a, a, a G1000 simulator uh, trainer or package. It's an e-learning course, uh, same as Max Trescott. And as a result, you uh, can learn, uh, spend a few hours on that, gain the skills that you need there and jump into a, a Cessna 172, perhaps working on your instrument rating and then acquire the skill there. Boy, that is the longest answer I think I've ever given on a, because I was so inspired by your question. So uh, any other questions, Logan? Yeah, we got another one. So um, also with the advancement of, of technology in the airplane, GPS is now being in there. Um, some airplanes have autopilot. Also the, uh, the introduction of the new ACSFA standards is it feasible for someone to complete a private pilot certificate in 40 hours? And is, is this a realistic goal that they should shoot for? If you're one of Ed Valdez's students, Ed Valdez, uh, yeah, it's quite a realistic goal. It would, uh, in fact, many of his students have acquired their private pilot certificate in, they were ready for their private pilot certificate in under 40 hours. And um, uh, as a result, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. But, but, you have to have an instructor whose desire is to help you get through the private pilot certificate without having to hemorrhage, you know, hundred dollars, hundreds of dollars every time you fly an airplane and uh, who has the open mindedness to allow you to use a flight simulator. Look, let, let's be frank about this. A, a lot of young instructors don't like to use simulators. And that's not a dig on young and flight instructors. You know, we all operate according to our incentive system. And the in incentive system of many young flight instructors is to fly. They don't want to sit in the simulator. Uh, they, they want to go fly. So uh, consequently, uh, they may not be as inclined to use a simulator. Now, how, how do you solve that? Well, I think the answer is obvious. You know, you find a flight instructor that is willing to use the simulator uh, in, in your training and to use uh, and to guide you in its use so that you, know, you don't develop any bad habits, but that's typically not an issue here. And, uh, and, and that uh, allows you to accelerate through the aviation training program and you take part in your own education. So that, that would be my, uh, my advice on that. Fantastic. Uh, we had another one. This one's kind of uh, out there, but with the advancement of technology, um, drone operations, being able to remotely fly aircraft uh, now, you know, without being in the cockpit. Um, also, the new Autoland feature that came out that they're putting in, uh, I think, the TBM. Do you believe that we will see fully automated aircraft replacing the need for a pilot in the cockpit in the future? <laughs> That's another great. That's another great question. Here's the answer to your question: As soon as automation becomes safer than the people who fly airplanes, automation will fly airplanes. That's that's a given. How can it not be? Because uh, because there's an economic incentive for the people that own the airlines. That in fact, th we have that right now. I, I mean, we've had it for the last 25 years. And anybody that's an airline pilot will tell you this. Uh, the the company tells you, no, 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 we don't want you to now. Let me, let me clarify this. Uh, up until about six or seven years ago, they were saying, we don't want you to fly the airplane uh, after you lift off the airplane. We want you to put it uh, on autopilot, fly to the destination, start down, and then you can hand fly it to land the airplane. That's changed a little bit because uh, what the FAA realized was pilots were uh, seeing a degradation of actual physical flying skills. Uh, folks, when the FAA sends out a, 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 a a SAFO, a safety advisory to everybody who flies airplanes and specifically directs it to airline pilots saying, you need to study what angle of attack means and you need to practice full stalls either in the airplane or in a simulator when you are uh, taking you, the practice you need to do and practice uh, when you're taking your annual recurrency. When the FAA said that, you know there was a dramatic degradation in skills. So the FAA's kind of, airlines have backed off a little bit and uh, in, in many airlines, they're actually encouraging a little more hands-on flying. But listen, listen that's, that's what's gonna happen. But, but even though there may come a time when the airplane is flown entirely automatically, and, and I know people say, well, that'll never happen. Yeah, but 
they said, oh, we'll never have three people on the, we'll never have three people on the cockpit when they got rid of the flight navigator. And they said, no, we'll never have two people in the cockpit. Then they got rid of the flight engineer with uh, the 747-400. And then all of a sudden they're saying, no, we'll never have one person in the cockpit. Well, uh, the trajectory of history is not with you. Uh, so as soon as you see a bunch of people in a drone flying uh, an unmanned drone, like the uh, E-Hang, which we have now, which not we, but the, the Chinese have made, that stops, picks you up and flies you to your destination. I think it would probably better be called the E-Hang On. I think they, they didn't name it properly. Okay, this is the E-Hang On, hang on. That way, in case you forget, you'll know the name. Oh, I'm hanging on as a preemptive uh, uh, strike against being hurt. So uh, that, that may eventually happen. Does it mean you're not flying? I don't think so. You know, you're still flying. Maybe you're still in command and uh, you're still up in the air. And besides, what difference does it make? You fly for an airline that doesn't let you touch the controls. And I'm being, ex I'm exaggerating now. I'm taking this to the far limit. You could still go out to the airport and run a small airplane and hand fly it. It's the same thing. It's just, you have fewer people to worry about in back. Because in a Cessna 150, there is no in back. So that's my, that's my response to that. Great. I think we got time for one more. So okay. um, in terms of the laws of learning and intensity uh, for a brand new student, would it be important to take them up in the actual airplane, at least for the first lesson or first couple of lessons before putting them into a simulator? Uh, that's, an, that's an excellent question. And uh, if you read uh, my article on flight simulators, the uh, and for that matter, uh, in any other thing I've ever written on the use of flight simulators, you'll find that uh, that's exactly what I say. You have to have some uh, foundation experience to know that when you pull back on the elevator like that, the nose is going to pitch up. You're going to feel a little push in the seat. When you do this, the airplane wings are going to bank. And uh, or if you do this with the rudders, and for those people that know, know what I'm doing here, these are rudders. A lot of students uh, never never see these things, of course, seldom use them. And uh, <laughs> I should, my bad, my bad. I, this is why I should never be left alone without adult supervision. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, that uh, causes the nose to go like that. Let me, let me do that again, just in case of, I see some people going, hmm, hmm. I gotta write that down. That's interesting. That's very interesting. So um, you need to have that foundation experience. One hour, maybe two, but that that minimum allows then the uh, uh, the necessary neural connections for someone sitting in the simulator uh, to uh, re reference to, um, uh, to, to to hook new information onto. In other words, that's the building block. And then you can build from there. Now, maybe, yeah, maybe after 10 hours, you go up and fly another fly an airplane for um, another hour. I'm, I'm assuming you're just taking a, a pure simulator class. Unlike Ed's student, who actually only had uh, two flights, one in the uh, middle of the six-month Sem a semester and the other one when he went out and did the whole thing by himself except for one time when the instructor took over and uh so instructor assisted i said take over but i'm not sure i'm I, i'll have to read my article again i'm pretty sure i said assisted instead of take over because if an instructor takes over it always sounds like oh my gosh you know it's a you did a terrible thing but you know i had an instructor take over during taxi so <laughs> that that uh may look bad but i was just having a hard time keeping the aircraft on the runway, on the taxiway. Those taxiways were very small when I learned to fly. Anyway, uh, and they didn't have the taxiway widening device that could be activated by the tower that makes the yellow line bigger. So it's easy. Okay. So uh, with, with that in mind, yeah, a couple of uh, scheduled intermediate flights makes it so much more uh, effective. The law of intensity was actually a perfect choice, uh, the, the perfect law to use there because uh, that's... Uh, that's exactly what it means. It means the experience is more meaningful to the student. Awesome, Rod. Well, again, we thoroughly appreciate your time. We're very, very fortunate and lucky that you were able to come on the show, and it was a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Logan. And let me let me say this: um, I, you know, I've written seven aviation books. I have tons of e-learning courses, all pretty unique. I have a forty-hour. Uh, interactive e-learning ground school, a lot of fun, all animated. It's good fun. That's what I do. I, I, I just enjoy teaching people. 
Uh, and uh, please go to my website, rodmachado.com. That's R-O-D-M-A-C-H. Oh, you can see it on the screen probably. rodmachado.com. And uh, there is a three-letter code that I'll give you that is a discount code. It's capital I, capital L, capital A. And that stands for Illinois Aviation, uh, uh, Illinois, Avi ILA, yeah, Illinois Aviation Academy, ILA. And uh, that will give you a 25% discount on anything that's in my store. And that's good till Saturday night. And uh, there is a book there called How to Fly an Airplane. And it contains all the things I've learned over the years about how to fly an airplane in very simplistic ways, heavily, um, heavily spiced with pictures. And it's the kind of book you can use to help you in your simulator training. And I will also say I have two syllabi, uh, two individual uh, syllabus that you can use for free. You can download them, just go to, uh, go to the website, put them in the cart, check out. One of them is a flight training syllabus. It's called a stick and rudder flight training syllabus. The other one is a ground school syllabus that helps schedule the, the uh, study that you uh, might want to uh, engage in in order to pro progress towards your private pilot certificate. So thanks very much, Logan. That's very kind of you. ILA will be the code and I will activate that. Illinois Academy, Illinois Aviation Academy. And uh, I will activate that as soon as we're done here and that code will be good to go. And uh, it was a real pleasure. And thank you everybody for listening. I really do appreciate allowing me to come into your, uh, your home and spend some time with you. Anytime, anytime, Rod. We'd love to have you again. And uh, it's uh, such a reward to have someone like you in our industry. So thank you. You're thank you for your kind. time tonight. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, guys, that's it for tonight. Uh, stay tuned. Next, uh, next week, the date's wrong on there. Next Wednesday night, we'll have uh, Michael Goulian on. Uh, he is a part of the Red Bull Air Racing team. And we'll be talking about uh, aerobatics. Have a nice night, guys.